Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here at PAX Unplugged with a very special guest, Cole Worley. How's your con going so far? It's going awesome, Liz. Thank you. So uh, you are currently at the Leader Games booth showing off Root. Do you want to tell us how that's been going? It's been going really well. This is actually the uh, release show for a game called Vast and Mysterious Manor, which is the game we've been working on over the last year, and it is, if you like Root, it's even more asymmetric, it's even goofier, it's got great character, and we've been having a great time showing it off to people. That is awesome. Although, I do like Root, but I actually want to talk to you about your historical game design. So, one of my favorite games of this year has been PAX Premier, and I was actually hoping that you would talk to us a little bit about how your academic background has bled into such an interesting and deep game. So, Premier was a strange game. I think I started designing games in graduate school just to help me understand what I was researching. It was like a pedagogical tool I used for my students, and then I kind of used it for myself, too. And then I've been working on developing some games for fun, and one of the people I was working with said, like, hey, have you ever thought about making a game that relates to your research? And I've been writing a, ch a chapter in my dissertation at that point about the great game, and it was kind of like I was mulling, I was mulling over it, or doing some field reading on it. And so it just started it just started kind of connecting a bunch of disparate interests I had. And it was tricky because right at the very start, like in, so I, I did studies on 19th century British imperialism, which is a really fraught period. And so I wanted to be really careful right at the beginning to not make kind of like a mucky, orientalist, silly, spy drama game. And everything that relates to the 19th century in uh, the 19th century abroad from the European perspective is like that. Um, so for people who don't know the period, the, the great game is like sort of like the Cold War, Sherlock Holmes style. So it's just like the Cold War shifted back a hundred years. But I really, like, that's the dominant narrative around it, and from very early on I wanted to push strongly against that. So I had this I had this idea after I, I saw a few speakers and I read this book about uh, about Afghanistan, and it, it fascinated me. It's called um, Tribe and Nation in 19th Century Afghanistan by a person named Christine Morrell. And it, it was such a fabulous book because it, it kind of re-centered how I was even thinking about the period. Oh, the, the British and the Russians, like, they aren't the heroes, they aren't the main actors. They're actually the incidental figures in this dynastic conflict. And at that moment, I was like, okay, I think this is actually the game. So in the same way, I mean, I think I would, when I was in school, I mean, even from a young age, I would always find games on subjects that I didn't know anything about. And the games were kind of almost like ways of teaching me about it, which they're a very bad way to learn about things like World War II or something, because they give you kind of a comic book version of the event. Uh, and so I wanted to use this game about Central Asia as a way of teaching a different perspective on the whole project. And so that took me down a deep reading list and gradually built out to when it became Premier. I did about a year and a half of source reading before I even started designing. And then before we started working on the second edition, I did like another year of research on it. Uh, so it has, there are lots of books <laughs> inside that game. So your vision with your game is that people who play it will pick up something about a historical period that you're passionate about and that you communicated about it responsibly with the people who play. Right. I mean, so most games, I mean, empire is a very common subject in gaming. And what I wanted to do was make a game about empire that looked at empire from the outside in. Mm -hmm. And I, my hope is that players who engage with it seriously will find a lot of commonalities and appreciation for the pressures that these people in Afghanistan are facing. Mm -hmm. And I try to do it in a way that like broadens the sympathetic lens rather than constricts it. So I'm actually curious. So I've, I've started doing some reading about this myself, and there's like so many interesting people involved in the great game. Uh, you know, major players, spies, you know, people from all sorts of, all parts of the world. So who do you feel the most sympathetic towards among the people who show up in your game? Yes, this is like the hardest question. Um, so there are Every card in, in Premiere has like a little paragraph about the history of each character, and it was so hard to edit those paragraphs. Because, and at one point, I would always include how they died, because they were. It's a little like, it's, it's a little, um, it's insane. I mean, it's like Game of Thrones. It's like, oh, this person was blinded and thrown in jail for ten years, or this person was pushed off a tower, or whatever. Uh, and I had to start cutting the the mortems on the characters because there was just too much stuff that I had to that I had to learn. I think. I mean, there are there are sympathetic characters, kind of. So th this is actually one thing that that I hope that the game does too. So um, it's very easy to vilify the, the Brits, and they're often rightly vilified for all the Europeans. But it's complicated. I think that there are characters who, at this time, especially because the game takes place in the eighteen twenties, 
and a lot of the the more grotesque forms of imperialist ideology come in the later 19th century. Mm -hmm. So many of the, the, the people who are, who are working have like a genuine appreciation and interest and curiosity and wanted to do something that could be responsible. So some two of my f favorite characters who aren't cards in the game, but are characters in the game are um, James Rattray and James Atkinson, who did all the art for the game. And these were, um, you know, doctors in the army who were also artists and who wanted to try to capture this period. And uh, their art is incredible. And it's sympathetic and detailed and interested in it. It doesn't fall into the cliches that are really common. In fact, one of the things when I was looking at this project as something to do, the, uh, the archive of art was so strong that I thought this actually is lending itself to, to the project. Um, I think you also find, I mean, there are, there are a lot of interesting characters and kind of different perspectives. I love uh, the arc of Das Muhammad's career, the kind of eventual war. I mean, he's a fascinating character who sort of like has power, loses power, comes in and out, and is able, I mean, he's like the consummate, uh, he's, he's the co consummate manipulator and organizer who's able to navigate these like impossible currents of uh, interest from all these groups. And I think if you want to, if you want to sympathize with like, I mean, really, he's kind of the hero of the whole game. Um, he, he's not always the hero in any particular match, but I think um, you, you can really a, appreciate uh, the, the skill of the operations that they were running. And like, he was actually, I mean, one of the things that um, I think you don't have to know to play the game, but uh, the Afghans win, sort of. I mean, it, it, it's, it's complicated in terms of how, how you view how the first Anglo-Afghan war shook out, but there's a better argument that, like, essentially what that means in game terms is that, like, Das Muhammad wins and does it by kind of navigating through almost all three coalitions of different spaces in his career. And I think I, I, so I found a lot of characters like that who, you know, when faced with these impossible circumstances, were able to sort of do marvelous things. Um, there's another character whose name I'm completely blanking. I know this is uh, there are there are like 105 unique characters, um, but um, he goes by Charles Masson, which was a, which was a, a name that was assumed. But he was a, a British uh, officer in the, or a clerk in the East India Company who ran away and escaped, and then lived in Afghanistan and Kabul for decades uh, undercover. And well, yeah, when he was d discovered, um, the organizers of the intelligence networks quickly sort of like blackmailed him into joining the intelligence network. But while he was in Afghanistan, um, he mostly uh, was interested in Afghan coinage and sort of ancient history of Afghanistan. And um, even Das Muhammad's son patronized him and, and, and sort of offered him sponsorships to do archaeological digs. And a moment like that seems insane that like here you have a runaway Brit that is in like writing local histories of a land he's not from and then getting state sponsor from the rulers of that land to produce these histories. And it just shows like how cosmopolitan and complex the past was. So that's a very long answer. <laughs> I like long answers. So, <laughs> so you are no stranger to examining sort of difficult aspects of history in your games. So I know also that you have one out about the opium trade. Would you like to speak about that for a little bit? So all of, you know, I think one of the things that I love about games is that they have a really dynamic emotional look. So like when you go to an art museum, you can feel very moved, very feel frightened you can feel sad uh, i think games are even sometimes more intimate than, than you know viewing a piece of art and so when i approach a game design i think about like the emotional range that i want the game to have and i think there are lots of games that valorize sort of imperial you know expeditions explorations exploits whatever and the, the response to that i feel like so you know, as we as we look at that subject and think about how can we act as good designers and good critics, one response is like, okay, we have to strike these games from our window because these are horrible, horrible things to do, which I think is very valid. Another valid thing to do would be like to find games that are um, in tune with other with other topics or like potentially romanticize or kind of invert classic. Uh, just the game Fist Mike Spirit Island, also like a val very valid and good thing, but. My own area of expertise, I think, hopefully gives me footing to write games that are that really critique and like are actually about the thing. Like I feel like well equipped to write games about empire that are not that don't hold that they have no bars hold held right or no holds barred. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the other way around. Um, and and so with traffic, what I wanted to do is um, 
I wanted to, and John Company does kind of similar amount of work, but they both travel in John Company, and I imagine them and Paris kind of being in this like trilogy of games kind of thing. Yeah. Um, with, within this traffic, what I wanted to do was look at the actions of the British merchants in China in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, and understand them through a domestic lens. This is a very like old school move. There's nothing like fancy about it in like the scholarly world. This is like very Edward Said, like 1990, right. cutting edge. So it's you know this this critique, the line of critique is 30 years old of the actual discipline or older. But I think it, it casts a lot of light on like why were these people behaving in such immoral ways? Well, right. it had to do with a domestic space or not a domestic but a domestic in the like geographic sense, a space where. They're playing these reputations. They're playing these games for status, and that are then, by the time you get all the way to the actual places where wealth is being extracted, uh, are, are leading to very immoral actions. But it's because their whole frame of world is being read through, you know, what what you might think of as like a, um, I don't know, like a, like a costume drama, like a rom com. So there's, there's a famous critique of uh, Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, which is like, oh, here's Mansfield Park. It's a Jane Austen novel. It follows the rules of Jane, Jane Austen novels. But it's also very much tied up in issues of money, mm -hmm. and it, but they're just hidden just right in the back, right? So you know, it, or if you've read Jane Eyre, like questions about like where's Winchester's money coming from, or like what ex exactly is the province of the bride? You know, all the these are like classic academic questions that, and, and what they do is they say, hey, that game marrying Miss Darcy or yeah. marrying Mister Darcy, yeah, yeah, like that game has a lot to do with the British Empire. You just don't necessarily know it. Right. And so rather than further bury empire, I want to pull it into more of those types of games. So are there any historical themes you're planning on touching on next in future releases? So I'm working on a game right now about American Reconstruction because when I used to, I used to tutor and teach AP U.S. history, and I found that the late 19th century American history of my students was exceptionally weak. Uh, the, the Civil War is like a, kind of almost like a clean three-act structure for them. And then it ends, and Lincoln shot. And, you know, there's surrender Appomattox, Lincoln shot, curtain closes, it's over. But for historians that work in the period, I'm not an Americanist by training, but I know Americanists, like talking to them and be, trying to, to become versed in it. Um, the Civil War is really the first act in a longer 12 year saga that is considerably less heroic. It's a lot, it doesn't quite have the same happy ending. I mean, it's really. It's kind of a story about how the United States attempted to do real nation building in its own borders and then failed. And so there are no games on the subject. Uh, I felt like my, my high school students never knew much about American Reconstruction. It's a very hard subject. Uh, and I feel like it might, there might be a way to walk players through some of the arguments and some of the sort of problematic positions of it. So I'm in the, I'm in the stages of researching for it right now. It could take two or three years before I'm actually ready to, to show it, but that'll probably be done through Drew and I's business, and we'll both read it. That is awesome. So, I have a question. So, looking at your designs, you tend to design very interactive games. So, Pax Premier has a fantastic solo mode developed by Ricky Royal, uh, and you know, Root now has solo bots, but is that something that is part of your own gameplay or your own design process, or is that something that gets added on? So it's something that gets added on later. My, I'm very fortunate to have a very strong stable of playtesters, and now like I work full time at Uber Games. We have ten people on staff, seven or so are in the office, so we're able to play twice a day without without worrying about anything. So I'm not <laughs> bots are added on sort of at the end of the process. And in fact, when I'm designing, I usually start with like the feelings, the narrative range, the emotional range I want the game to have. That leads me to think about like. What are the points of interaction? And I always think about um, the, the pressures the system puts on the player, mm -hmm. the pressures other players put on, on the player. And then the mechanisms are like the last step. They're like the very, very end. I never start with like, I'm going to make a worker placement game. <laughs> that, that never, that, that never, uh, in fact, whenever I've had a mechanism, it never works. Mm -hmm. I always, I get too attached to it and it doesn't, it doesn't play out. Um, but for the solo modes, um, the game numbers, the games behave very differently at each number because they're almost like, I don't have the right way to, to say it, but it's like they're they're fundamentally different. Like right. a one player game is fundamentally different from a two player game, which is fundamentally different from a three player right. game. There is di there, there are more difference than, than like a genre of film. Or like it, it's almost like a different medium. Um, so a lot of times, like with, with Premiere, um, the three player dynamic I think of as like the core dynamic. The four player one supplements it. The five player one supplements it. 
And the two player one is kind of a totally different game. And so what we wanted to do is like the rise of these automated players, the autonomy and stuff like that. I was talking to Ricky about it. I was like, I want a bot that we can use in one player mm -hmm. or use in two player and it will still work and it will create the feeling like pull players into that three player game space because that's where the game feels like it has the, the most expressive shape. Um, so we, we do them later and I've, I, I've tried to build a few that I think with each one I'm getting a much better sense of like what makes it work. So I, when I first started doing solo games, I always started with the, okay, I have to make this hard. So like, okay, it has to be hard, it has to be very difficult, <laughs> and only expert play will lead you to victory. And so the, the root bot that I built, Character Marquee, is fiendishly difficult, and you can only beat it if you are really bending the system, if you are really like pushing on every little point. And um, that's an interesting exercise, but it doesn't produce anything that is narratively coherent at all. And right, so it loses, that, it loses the emotional range that you're looking for in the yeah. game. And then, so with, with the new bots for Rue, um, one of the things that, that most impressed me about the submission of the bots, um, again, uh, the guy's name is just blank. Ben, or I don't know, I can't remember. He did a great job. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Um, so the original submission, and then once we started developing them, is that they had the feeling of a game, which means that sometimes the bot makes a stupid move. Mm -hmm. But it's okay uh, because it's making a move that a human player might make. And uh, one of the things I love about, about Ricky's bot for Premiere is that it really does feel like you're squaring off against a human player right. who's got like a couple of advantages mm -hmm. that you that you can't get around, but you find yourself trying to like get in its head. Mm -hmm. And so in um, th there's a there's a really funny um, we've been thinking a lot lately about like theory of mind when you're playing games, right. which is how do you like what do you think like how do you imagine the other players are thinking about. How you're imagining them or about the game itself and this to me is a really important element of like bot and ai design because i want to try to like get in the bot's head mm -hmm. and if i'm doing that if i if i can imagine it as like having a mind then it's going to like put me in the experience of playing the game without other players so with, with, with the root bots i i've become a lot more attuned to this now drew and i were able to help out a lot on the, the final stages of development for lacan and then um i helped to develop the, the, the second wave of root bots and at the end of it i felt like okay i was thinking about these as mechanical puzzles but they're actually more about building a little mind and that that shift i think has really changed how i approach a lot of these solo games so is solo gaming something that you've ever bothered with much yourself or do you prefer more interactive gaming in your I, own time i i have all i've always been looking at players uh my wife and i we, we play war games uh, so we, we have a lot of um we, I I had never really done solo games, with a few exceptions. I had played um, the Last Station was one that's like an old uh, space game. Mm -hmm. Played Navajo Wars, which is a pretty remarkable design. Um, and so I I'd done a little bit of solo work, but it's not something that like fits cleanly into my 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 gaming diet usually. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when we um when we were working out on the root bots, we had this funny experience where we always had two or three players, so we were just testing one or two bots at a time. Right. And at one point, uh, <laughs> someone on staff was like, "Wait a second. We've always had two or more players in these games with bots. We need to start playing them with just one player. And I was like, oh, okay, of course. We, you know, we have a big chart of all the design stuff. We need right. the liabilities we have to check off. And so we, we started saying, okay, well, we're going to run three tables. Everybody gets three bots and we run the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so, like, it doesn't fit into my diet. But the I also think that I, I think that there are kind of, like, two places in gaming where there's a lot of innovation happening and no one's paying attention. One of them is like good solo design. The other one is like small single session indie RPGs. Mm -hmm. Tons of excellent work is happening there that like is applicable to the way I make games. But if I'm not, so like I, 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 I follow the work of Tom Russell pretty closely and I always read the rules and try to play a lot of the solo designs. Right. And I won't play them usually that much because they don't fit into my diet, but they, they always give me food for thought. So solo agnostic. Yeah, I'm a solo agnostic. <laughs> Just, I'm just not sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you talking to all of us here at PAX. And everybody who's watching, happy gaming. Thank you very much for having me.